Hello everyone, and welcome back to E2E. Today, we might as well be a renewables company with the way we're getting into environmental tech. I'm not sorry. Terrible jokes aside though, I want to keep the passive generation theme of last episode going and start with the final boss of passive generation, the Void Ore Miner. Before we do any of that though, let's take a look at what I did between episodes. The first thing I did was finish our passive setup room, and if you're a fan of glowing cubes, great news. The idea behind this was to start to hide the machines a little bit more, to not have the wires and blocks so exposed. All of the machines are still here, but I like the idea of hiding them behind these arcane looking structures. I also finished up the walls, the columns, and added these bridges that connect to the catwalks. I was unsure of them at first, but I've come to actually really like how they look. I think they really play into this room's vertical aspect, because at the end of the day, it is a pretty tall room, so having something to fill up this space with a unique design that I haven't used elsewhere, I think that turned out really well. Beyond that room, what I did between episodes was decide that we really need to deal with this immersive engineering room. I would love for it to be able to stay, and you guys did give some great suggestions on how to cover it up, but ultimately, it's just too big and takes up too much space inside of the main pyramid. So, I'm going to have to take on the boring task of taking this entire room and moving it somewhere else. It's not going to be easy, and it might take me a while, and... I'm kidding. This is already the new immersive engineering room. You can see that these windows up here don't look onto the farmlands like the previous ones did. This door is different, although I did move my cats over. And currently, there's no hallway here. We're no longer up at the pyramid level, but we are instead down here, and connected to the hallway, right across from the industrial foregoing room. For the most part, we're actually directly downward from the old one. And as for that one, well, it's seen some better days. As much as I really like this location, it does have to be sacrificed for the greater good. But with this room cleared out and slated for destruction, it's time that we get started on the new stuff. As I'd mentioned, today's goal is to get a start into environmental tech. The void ore miners are multi-blocks that will require quite a few blocks, and key among them are these six-tiered crystals right here. The first of these crystals is litharite, which you might remember from way back when we made our deep dark portal. We'll need a little over 60 of these crystals for our first Void Ore Miner, which then becomes self-sustaining, but given that it took me multiple hours to find two of these for the portal, I don't think that looting dragon layers for 60 more of them is going to work out. This time, we'll be making it the intended way. That is, we make it by pouring Enderium over a terrestrial artifact. And if you're asking yourself what in the world a terrestrial artifact is, well, it's a combination of all of the empowered crystals from Actually Editions. We currently can't automatically make these, so let's fix that. In order to make them, you can use a Combination Crafter, Draconic Evolution Fusion Crafting, or, if you're really poor, the Empowerer. And guess which one we're stuck with. This ugly mess right here is our current Empowerer setup, but I think we can do a little bit better. Since it's not a big setup, I thought that a cool place for it would be up here. This is our old and now not functional mob farm. Let's clean this place up a little bit and set it up. So I've gone ahead and I turned our mob farm into a little bit of a nice hot spring here. Obviously, it's nothing quite like, you know, the entire underground lake there, and our empowerer is hidden beneath the water. In order to actually do the wiring, there's a staircase down and a little room underneath. A room that I'm realizing I didn't build quite correctly. One second. Okay, that's a little bit better. I've added a proper cutout for the display stands and a little area for our interface. 
Now, let's look at how we automate the display stands and the empowerer. The trick here is that we need to send different items to five different locations, but the items all start from the same area. The way to do this comes in the form of item lasers from Actually Editions. Full credit for this automation system goes to Lekutree on the Enigmatica Discord, by the way. This will need an item interface and, as I'd mentioned, some item lasers. I know these are energy lasers, but all we need to do to convert them is drop them in front of an atomic reconstructor. What we want to do here is connect the interface and the item interface. From here, we give this an item laser, and then put an item laser on the empowerer and on each display stand. We can use a compass to increase the priority for this middle one. We will also need to give all of these power. We'll also need a way of getting the items out, and for that I'm going to use flat transfer nodes that will pull into an ender chest. We should be able to request our test craft. This is about the time in which I remember that you actually need to connect the lasers. They do not work automatically. And now it does seem to have started working. The craft completes, gets sent into the ender chest, and we now have 49 ultimate control circuits. Mission success. I should also point out that the empowerers suck. This is a terrible system, they are super slow. But when we unlock combination crafting, the pedestals and crafting core will be a drop-in replacement, so we'll be able to keep this system going forward. And all that's left to do now is encode the rest of the recipes. The final thing to note with this system is that the central item here needs to be the first one in the recipe. Okay, so it probably has not been very long for you, but I have just finished passiving all of the components for these empowered blocks. Now, this is all probably a little overkill, because in reality, we need more like 10 of each block. But still, it's good to have stuff fully automatic. As the last of these finish crafting, I do want to point out that there's one small flaw with our plan. In order to empower the diametine blocks, we need three things that we can already make, and mana diamonds, which we have not dealt with at all. In fact, we haven't even looked into Batania. So if we want to finish up all these empowered crystals, we're going to need to go on a little bit of a detour. Batania starts in pretty typical fashion, by punching flowers. But the first place where this mod pack throws you a bit of a curveball is in making the very basic Batania item the Petal Apothecary. Normally, it's just stone, but here, we need to make it in a luminous crafting table. In order to get ourselves a luminous crafting table, we'll have to find one of these Astral Sorcery Temples, dig down a little bit, and put a crafting table below this floating crystal. We'll also want to make sure that it has access to the night sky. We can set the recipe up, but like I mentioned, until the stars are out, this crystal will not activate. That's a cool effect. At least, I think that's how it works. And of course it has started to rain. In order to speed things up, I made this eclipsed clock, which allows you to set a certain time. We can go all the way to night here. And then we can use some of our time in a bottle to skip the time of day to that. But even though it's midnight and there seems to be a shooting star, uh still doesn't work. I'm gonna be totally honest with you, I don't know what I did different, but we can now craft the luminous crafting table. And while it seems to be working, I'm gonna make a resonating wand as well. And now that we have this crafting table, because it's still night, it seems to be full of starlight, and we can craft our petal apothecaries. We can now start into Batania. With our Petal Apothecary, we can make pure daisies and get to work on making Living Rock. Our mana generation will be handled by Endo Flames. In order to make this mana pool, we're also going to need a Rock Crystal, which is a pretty rare ore. But luckily, technology has our back. Our laser base can get us stacks and stacks of rock crystal ore, and all we need to do is mine it and get some. 
In order to move the mana that we generate around it all, we'll need infused wood, which requires starlight. This, in turn, comes from a light well, so it is back to our temple and our luminous crafting table. Three of these should be enough, and I believe the way these work is it, when you put a certain item in there, they will start producing liquid starlight, and the better the item, the less of a chance it is for it to break. For example, I imagine that aquamarine is the shortest lived, and a celestial crystal is probably the best, but honestly, I don't know. Now this, I have no clue what this is, but it spawned next to- they're multiplying. Note to self, do not punch the flares. You see what I mean about the crystals breaking, though. In any case, we can now set down the starlight and throw some wood into it. Now, I thought that this was going to be one bucket of starlight per log, but apparently it just does an unlimited amount. This infused wood can now make living wood and our wand of the forest. Okay, so now we have a mana pool mana generating flowers. The last thing we need is the mana spreader. All of this is easy, but illumination powder is actually quite tricky. Not really, but this item in the middle, Nitor, requires us to get into Thomcraft, yet another magic mod, and I really don't want to do that. So instead, let's look at the tooltip here. Drops from ball of fur with 1% chance. Hmm. If only there were some way for me to get balls of fur. Well, I saw this coming, and I've stockpiled over a stack of them. It's 1%, and this is less than 100, so let's see if we get lucky. Hey! Amidst all this other random crap, right here. Illumination powder. Now, we have everything we need to make our mana spreader and we can start generating some mana. Just to shift right click everything to link them all up. And all these endo flames need is a combustible material. And the mana spreader will start to get some mana and send it into our mana pool. This will allow us to make our first mana diamond. Now, I realize that this setup is, in many ways, absolutely terrible, but I don't really care about getting into Batania at this moment. All I wanted were these 10 mana diamonds, so that I can request our empowered Diamatine blocks. Now that we have all of our empowered blocks, we can make our terrestrial artifacts, which we can immediately convert into a stack of Litherite. While these crystals finish, I'm going to set up the other recipes for the Void Ore Miner. So, with all of our crystals crafted up, we should be able to now make our first Void Ore Miner. And I don't say first lightly, we are going to need a lot of these things. The controller provides a handy list of all the needed materials, where we can see just how much of our precious Litherite is getting used up. But we now have 24 structure frames, 20 structure panels, 1 magenta laser lens. This gives us the best odds at the next tier of crystal. All that should be left is the void or minor controller. In order to assemble it, you can use the assembler to right click and start placing down blocks. Now that it's assembled, we uh, need to power the guy and I'm not sure how. So. I went ahead and figured out that the energy has to apparently just come from the top. The laser obviously needs line of sight down until bedrock, and the outputs will happen somewhere. Well, there we go. It is very slowly generating us some resources. Unfortunately, none of these are what we want. But I don't think there's any other solution other than to chunk load this, let it run, and check back in a while. Okay, so it's been a couple days for me, and I'm going to catch you guys up on what you missed. Amazing, isn't it? Seriously, most of the time has been spent waiting for this thing to make us new crystals. Once I had enough Chironite, I upgraded it to Tier 2. Once that made enough Erodium, I upgraded it to Tier 3. And once that made enough Palladium, I made it Tier 4. And I made a couple modifiers for it along the way. 
That's it. That's all you've missed. The reason I brought you back before I upgraded this to an even higher tier is because right now, it is taking about 140,000 RF per tick to run. And that's awfully close to the max that we can produce, 160,000. Rather than have our entire network go offline to mine some funny crystals, I figured it would be a better idea to upgrade our power. These solar arrays are big banks of solar panels that just produce a ton of power. You make them with a lot of crystals, and then they give you free energy. If that sounds a little overpowered, that's because they kind of are. In order to make them less abusable, everything after the tier 3 is going to require extended crafting, which we haven't gotten into yet. Up until the last one, which is just... whatever. Because we can do none of this yet, we are limited to the tier 3. As with all the other Envirotech multi-blocks, we first make the controller, bring it up to tier 3, and 49 tier 3 solar cells. As with the rest of these multi-blocks, you just need to right-click the controller to build it. And given that these are solar panels, we'll need to make sure that it's day. Now we can see that it's generating us a little bit over 70,000 RF per tick. And don't get me wrong, that's not bad at all, but it's not enough to even power half of the miner right now, and I want to upgrade this to tier 5. So how do we deal with that? Luckily, there's a solution. The solar cells used can be of any tier, meaning that we can upgrade all of them to tier 5 and run them in a tier 3 solar array. Now we go from 70,000 RF to 260, a much needed improvement. In the next episode, I'd like to be able to get this all the way to tier 5, but for now, I'm just happy that I'll be able to use this to upgrade our miner. We should have everything we need to make the tier 5 controller, and realize that I made a very small mistake. Uh-oh. So up until now, all of the structure panels have cost a resource like diamonds or emerald, and I kind of overlooked the part where we now need a nether star for each one. The smart way to fix this would have been to make a wither farm, but I never claimed to be smart. I just headed out to the desert and started shooting. With all of the wither slaughtering out of the way, we can make the missing structure frames and craft our tier 5 void miner. And given that this guy uses 230,000 RF per tick, the 260,000 coming from here is pretty good. Unfortunately, getting the last tier is going to be difficult because we have not even started on this RTG fuel. There's kind of a whole branch of nuclear in this mod pack that I have not touched. So for now, we'll just be happy with this guy. What we shouldn't be happy with, however, is that right now, they're just sitting over here on this random peninsula. Not worked into our base whatsoever. I think we can definitely do a little bit to work them into the aesthetics. Before that though, we can bump our power generation up even further. 6th tier Athium Crystals, and use them to make the best solar cells we can. Again, still limited to the tier 3 controller, but this will provide us with plenty of energy. From 260,000 to 700,000. That was even more than I was expecting. Wow. Obviously, if we don't skip the night, this only works 50% of the time. But even so, that's still twice what our advanced generators are making. And this is really not that expensive. So, inspired by how much power these guys can actually make, I've been considering using them for our late game power. The biggest issue, obviously, is that they just work during the day. But I think there's a solution. All we need to do is make twice as many of them, have them feed into one huge battery, and then use all of that power at night when they aren't producing. Wait a minute, that's just how real solar panels work. Anyways, for the battery, we'll be going with Mechanism, because it has the coolest sounding one in all of modded Minecraft. The Induction Matrix. It can be as big or small as we need, and we fill it with these ultimate induction cells. It is a good thing that they store so much energy, because these guys are expensive. To craft 10 of them, it is going to take us over 17,000 gold. But faced with the opportunity of making such a good power generation setup, I can't resist. 
So to you guys, probably not that much time has passed. But me? I've been busy. Assuming I've done my math right, and that's not a guarantee, this should be enough for four more solar panels like the one we have out there, in addition to 2 trillion RF worth of storage. I think that should last us a very good while. And as for where we're gonna put them, they're gonna go somewhere we haven't really used before. They're going in the sky. Since these solar panels are by nature a little flat and visually uninteresting, rather than trying to work them into our existing structures, I thought that we could put them as floating islands in the sky. If I remember how to build islands correctly, I think this could look really, really nice. Well, I don't know if I'd call them really, really nice yet, but I definitely think they're a good start. But given that terraforming is probably one of my weaker skills, I think they came out alright. And once I get the solar panels in them and decorate the top, I think they'll look much better. As for the solar panel themselves, the plan is pretty simple. Just build them within the island itself. I considered having one giant island with a lot of them, but I like the idea of having them spread out across multiple. With all of them now built, we can have them feed into quantum entanglo borders. All that's left to do now is to set up our induction matrix, which is actually very easy. All we need to do is make a shell out of induction casing, fill the inside with induction cells, and at least one induction provider, and then finally place down two induction ports somewhere in the shell. Now we should have a UI, and with a quantum entangler porter, we can start filling it. You can see that our input is about 2.7 million RF per tick. Obviously, these only work during the day, so on average our total production will be 1.3, but that's still almost 10 times better than our advanced generators. Additionally, Look at how all of this power, billions of RF, is nothing. By having such a huge battery, and an expandable one at that, we will be able to have power for days. Whenever I get the chance, I'll still upgrade some of these solar panels, but for now, this should be great. Now, at this point, you might be wondering why I felt the need to upgrade these guys, because honestly, they're not even having to run at their full speed all the time. And that's a totally valid question, but if you guys remember last episode when we made all the sieves here, I asked for a couple names to put in them, and I expected to get like 5, maybe 10 names, but no. And instead, we got 10 times that, and that means that I'm going to need a lot more of these sieves, and all of them are going to be using power. And in order to make room for them all, I've also had to expand our tunnel just a bit. And now, 80 sieves, 80 interfaces, and 80 material stonework factories later, we are producing ores at an insane rate. Just look at Osmium. That is ridiculous! And now, it's time to name all of these sieves. And if I happen to forget yours, I promise it is not intentional. Just comment it again and I will make sure to add you. Anyways, let's start with... Troxorus, Hoyt, Toastchan, Dr. Friendly, Hatastic, Dumb Idiot 129, The Thicken, The Only Mercury, III Dan, Warimano, Silante, Thomas Sturps, Aiden Cake 191, One and Only Lou, Rizzy, Stag, Test Tube 234, Shadow Glitch 76, Jimbo Wadey, Daltino a bunch of numbers, Ugins, Ninjack a bunch of numbers, Mr. Chaos 42, Bricks and Znooks, IU Rock, It's Just Svenny Boy, Hagazissa, Nassos, Blurbadurb, Siva Experiment, 
Sensei Archer, Vlada Krepper, Fuzzy Z, Zait Sevi, Vitasp, Withermancer, DM Nerd, The Tiniest Dragon, Damp XR, Drakitty, Nefrex, Julianus One's Way, Acoustic Peepo, Bulbina, Snurt Gunge, Haze Was Taken, Sine Wave, Don Bebijon, Daffo Dillon, Lucifer A Bunch of Numbers, Dank Void, Sky Master, Onyx Agata, Drider 700, Confusions, Chromy Steel, Servant Frost, Godspeed 48, Silver, Wormst Tweaker, Mommy Raven, Ojek FX, Kabuki, Themely, Anglox, Sepia, Bimo Baka, Copious Robin, Bakura, and Axton Durg. A massive thank you to all of you who sent your names. I have a feeling you will be absolutely wonderful down here in the slave mines. Anyways, thank you all very much for watching. Thought I'd go off the edge, didn't you? Look forward to next episode, which I suspect will be a really big one. But for now, stay cool.